We need to talk about Shonen Jump. It's currently 2022 and Demon Slayer's finished, Hell's Paradise is finished, Jujutsu Kaisen is leaning towards its last star, Chainsaw Man's done, or is it? It's becoming very clear that a lot of big series have either already ended or are nearing towards it, but keep your goddamn chin up, sir. There's so much left to appreciate. Are you kidding me? We've got stuff like this, this, and this coming out, which by the way, you should watch my video on it. It's pretty good. Are you aware of the fact that the hardest manga panel of all time recently came out and no, I'm not talking about this or this. On December 8th of 2021, One Punch Man released its newest chapter that literally introduced God. And not only did they introduce God, they put that shit in color. Are you out of your mind? It was so cool. It was so awesome. I want to take that panel, show it to a tattoo artist, and put that shit on my forehead. It was so beautiful. This man Murata broke Newton's sixth law, and that's a fact check your textbooks. Allow me to introduce you to some of the shit that's coming out. A refined assassin finds love and gets married in pursuit of living a happy and normal life and has to beat some ass to hide his identity. A teenager lives in a world full of magic and wizardry and goes to Hogwarts with nothing but his pure muscle and love for cream puff. Two high schoolers have to fight off mystical beings like aliens and horny turbo grannies, which by the way, you should go watch that video. Yes, so many series are coming to an end, but so much good is coming out that's new. With all of this, how does one even compete? As a manga artist, what the hell could you even come up with that could possibly even compare to the quality that's been coming out? I guess all you have to do is come out with a manga that's a fanboy of all of them. Ayashi moans about a kid who wants nothing more in his life than to be a manga protagonist. Goku, Jotaro, Kenshiro, you name it. There's nothing cooler than an MC who's big and strong and has a name for their main special attack. Rasengan, Spirit Bomber. If you want to take the One Punch Man route, you name your attack Supreme Purgatorial Explosive Heat Wave Motion Gya. Maro has done nothing but read manga his whole life, which is not, that's not that's not relatable or anything. And just like any other kid, he followed the same training routine you'd see in the books. Punching rocks, kicking trees, sitting crisscross applesauce for a weirdly long period of time, and at first that shit really hurt. But unlike my videos, the more often you do something, the better you get at it. So eventually, Maro started getting really good at it. Punching boulders, doing weird handstands, and flipping tires. Some might even say he was getting too good at it, because by the time Maro was in high school, there was literally nothing left for him to train for. Maro had developed what we like to call the Saitama Syndrome. The dude overtrained. This guy's routine no longer became useful because punching sandbags was no good, and Maro needed to find a way to make money. Weightlifting, sumo wrestling, push training, okay, maybe combat stuff is no good. How about a regular job? Buns, sandwich breads, curry breads, it looks like he's no good for anything. It's getting to the point where even Maro is starting to feel like there's nothing left in this world for him to be useful at. He doesn't even get to partake in the simple joy of getting picked on in school because being near him will just lead you to the ER. The dude's just too strong. It feels like all hope is lost until we come across a certain someone. What Maro doesn't know is that while all this is happening, something big has just transpired that might change the fate of Japan forever. Supposedly, the chairman of the largest criminal organization has passed away. Yakuza from all across the region have come together to set their differences to give their prayers to what might as well be the strongest gang leader of all of Japan. All that's left is for the next successor of the chairman to be decided on as soon as possible. The only thing is, any sense of balance in the crime organization went down the drain because now you have every single syndicate in the Yakuza wanting to claim that throne. And so I'm over here reading this manga, seeing this dude like, oh, okay, so this is about a strong boy fighting off gangs and criminals and Jesus fucking Christ. Caterpillars with swords, flamethrowing skulls, big giant beefy fish monsters. This is far from a plot involving gangs and crime organizations. It's straight up terrifying. It was at this point I found out this was the same mangaka who made Hell's Paradise, and half of Hell's Paradise consists of- What am I even looking at right now. So back to where we left off. There's a clear indication that something's off about Maro. Maybe it was the whey protein or the trembolone sandwiches this guy was consuming, but something along the way made him way too overpowered. Urahara, daughter of the chairman who has now passed away, recognizes Maro's potential, and in pursuit of seeking revenge on those involved in the death of her father, she's looking to start her own syndicate in the Yakuza, making Maro her first employee. For him, he's probably think the job will consist of... What he doesn't know is that this job will most likely consist of 
And the following chapters consist of Maro and Urahara causing mayhem to varying syndicates across Japan, and many of these organizations become wary of this Beavis and Butthead pair of psychopaths. One has a fetish for getting punched in the face, and the other has a kink for world domination. Maro has never been in a serious fight and has never been given the chance to feel like the manga protagonist he's always wanted to be. So for him, working under Urahara has given him that main character thrill that he's been looking for his entire life. And I'm kind of liking this newer feel for how MCs are written in shonen mangas. It feels like there's not that much interest in more Dekus and Tanjiros who are like... And more deranged characters being put in the spotlight like Denji and Maruo who are like... And this level of unhingedness can be said for the rest of the characters in this manga, and that's mostly because of the types of people we're going to be dealing with. You see, organizations that hold control over industries like prostitution, gambling, and varying other stuff in Japan are all run by Ayashimon, and Ayashimon are these dudes. They're not human, but they're not exactly monsters either. From what we know, they're like spirits that take control over vessels every 99 years or so. As their income increases, so does the vessel that they're using, which is why Ayashimon Ashimon are way more interested in using their vessels for industries and crime since you know, money and bitches kind of tends to be their thing. But what's confusing everyone and their mother is the fact that some regular broski like Maro is able to go hand in hand with one of these. It's not like there's anything special about him. He's literally just some kid who punched boulders and kicked trees for a while. Nobody seems to really understand how or why he's this strong. The other weird conundrum lies with Urahara, but in order for me to explain why that is, I'm gonna have to go on a little bit of a tangent on something that I like to call the Baki effect. Now, first of all, if you've never watched Baki before, what a shame. I would highly recommend either watching Super Eye Patch Wolf's video on it or going on Netflix and watching it for yourself, but the plot's incredibly simple in which a teenager by the name of Baki Hanma wants to pursue his dreams of becoming the strongest warrior on the planet. And I don't mean like some of these people can do a couple push-ups. Baki might as well be called the Flexing Olympics. Just... Give me a sec, I need to mentally prepare myself to talk about this end. This dude straight up survived the electric chair. There's a Russian convict who gets sent into the highest federal prison, and this prison consists of nothing but a gigantic metal tube, and you wanna know how he escapes this solitary confinement that's designed like a Pringles can? He just climbs it, he just rock climbs it with his fingers! WITH HIS FINGERS! This guy is tougher than this guy, but then Baki smashes his face in one punch, but then this dude beats the shit out of Baki in one smackaroonie. Did I mention Muhammad Ali and George Bush are in this anime? Baki is literally an entire series of nothing more than a dick measuring contest. Four entire seasons and each one being more extreme than the last one. And after you've exposed yourself to enough of this luxury, you start to notice that Baki the Grappler has a pattern. And I have not found a name for that pattern yet, so we're either gonna call it off-screen flexing or the Baki effect. You may vote in the comments which one you think sounds better, but in order to explain this, I'll take an example from the show's latest iteration. In season four of Baki Hanma, Hanma <laughs> in season four of Baki Hanma, our MC purposely decides to get himself arrested so he can get shipped off to America's most excessive and brutal prison. And in Baki's mind, he figured the only way he could do this was by holding the president of the United States hostage. I still cannot believe that George Bush is in this show. And the reason for wanting to be placed in the most extreme solitary confinement was in hopes of getting a chance to fight against some of the world's most dangerous criminals. And those who were most feared in this prison were Sergio Oliva and John Guevara. And as a viewer, you already know Sergio Oliva is insanely strong because he's based on a famous bodybuilder. And in the anime, the dude's literally built like a brick shit house and has whooped some ass in previous seasons. But what you, as a viewer, are more curious about is this unknown South American fighter named John Guevara. Now, how exactly do we save time and make it obvious that this dude's a total badass. Well, the backy way would be starting off with the fact that he moves into his prison cell and discovers that his cell buddy, of all people, is f***ing Mike Tyson. So then you meet Mike Tyson, who is the greatest heavyweight boxing champion of all time, and find out this dude's telling Backy to keep quiet. And the reason for him telling to keep quiet is because he might disturb this dude, who's the real deal. Only then to find out that this mammoth of a guy 
is scared shitless of this dude. Which leads to the final reveal that this guy is John Guevara, known as the prison's most dangerous criminal of all time. And that is what I mean by calling something the backing effect. Instead of having some crazy special attack or having a character talk about how big and strong somebody is, the backy way of doing things is by creating a character A and a character B, and the way you give character A credibility is by having character B, who's already established as a strong character, be scared shitless of character A. And after you notice it the first time, you realize this is a pretty common trope that exists in a lot of shonen series. This storytelling point is what makes a lot of characters in Ayashimon really intriguing to me. Like, I cannot wait for the future chapters. Because remember when I said that there's a big fat question mark behind Urahara? That's because there's a lot of big and tough bad guys who are well respected amongst the Yakuza. And even for them, Urahara is someone who they're scared shitless of. Which for someone like me, who has a heavy addiction for shonen power scaling trash, seeing shit like this gets me bricked up. Now, first thing to know, there's only 8 chapters as of right now while I edit this. And after each one that you read, you very quickly start to realize that Maruo is a lunatic. He's like a Saitama who actually enjoys taking damage. It's really strange. Like, I hope you guys understand that this is the Yakuza we're talking about. These people will skin you, shit on your mother's face, and then steal your Pop-Tarts. But even for these guys, the MC is a straight-up deranged weirdo. I don't know what it is about this guy that makes him both so relatable and likable, even though I share zero traits with him. I don't know if it's the breaking the third wall thing going on over here, or second wall. I honestly don't really know what the regular are for these things. It could also be the fact that unlike Saitama, fights do feel fairly close. As a matter of fact, every single fight in this manga feels fairly close. You know how like at the start of any anime or manga, the first enemy you see will look like this, and they're usually like, <laughs> take a look at this shrimp, and the MC gets their ass whooped until they learn about the power of friendship, and then in the second season, all of the enemies for some reason look like but Ayashimon doesn't really suffer from a power scaling problem because every fight is settled under what's called a ritual duel. A ritual duel is basically a rule set where every duel has to be a one-on-one, -on -one, and any bet that's made under an oath that those two will have to be followed afterwards. So, not only does money make you stronger, you also gamble for every single fight you take. So if you bet that the winner of a fight gets a 2007 Nissan Altima, well, if you lose, then that means you're gonna have to make a down payment of exactly 47.63 for that 2007 Nissan Altima. So when Morrow hears this, he's like, holy fucking shit, wow. And then when you hear this, you're like, holy fucking shit, wow. So there's an incentive to be engaged in kind of every single fight. I don't know if this was done on purpose, but in my head, I thought this was pretty genius. It genuinely feels like anyone who's ever associated or even gone near Tatsuki Fujimoto is put under a spell where they can make amazing stories afterwards. Here's the pros and cons if you read this manga. Pros. The MC is psycho. It's only eight chapters. Cons. It's only eight chapters. There's unfortunately only so much I can work off of with eight chapters, but a fandom is rising and I see a lot of potential in this series. Hell's Paradise is getting an anime adaptation and it's gonna be great, so mentally prepare yourself to be amazed and exposed to a lot more of Yuji Kaku's work. You should check out Ayashimon and let me know what you guys think. Also, if you have any recommendations or something similar, let me know. I do read every comment and put any of your recommendations onto a list for stuff that I should check out. I promise I am actually reading manga and working on stuff. I just had a bit of a slump. Last week, I went to go see some snow with the boys and things are going better now. I'm working on something big and I'm not too sure how long it's gonna take, but just to give a hint, it has to do with a schizophrenic surviving a goddamn zombie apocalypse. So if you might want to subscribe and see how that turns out. Um, I don't really know what I did to deserve such nice comments that you guys leave me. Especially shout out to Hater Truman. You left really kind comments on every single one of my videos. So God bless you, bro. You make my day. Anyways, make sure to subscribe or don't. Like the video or do not. Check out Ayashimon. Also, I need to clarify something for all you people that keep pronouncing my name wrong. My name's Alex. So the joke is that the channel is like something you enunciate out loud. Ah, Lex. Anyways.